What a delight to get to be in the house of the Lord together, to sing together, to open the word. You know, the, the, the Bible is so rich because not only does it instruct us, but you know, it's, it's not merely descriptive. Here's who God is. And it's not merely imperative. Here's what you need to do. The Bible itself is performative. In other words, it enables us to follow the Lord. It enables us to be changed and to be conformed to his image. And so there's something incredibly significant that happens when the people of God come and sit together under the, the word of God and the Holy Spirit applying that word transforms us into the very likeness of our Savior. And that is precisely what Paul is telling us in the book of Romans. He spent uh, the first 11 chapters describing to us what this incredible salvation is and uh, how God has accomplished it through Jesus Christ, how we can have it simply and only by faith. But when we come to him in faith, when we receive this incredible gift of salvation, it shapes us, it changes us. And now after those first 11 chapters, now Paul turns from that doctrine to the duty and we read in Romans chapter 12, verse one, to remind ourselves of the context, he says, I appeal to you therefore brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that by testing you may discern what is the will of God what is good and acceptable and perfect. C.S. Lewis wrote, imagine yourself as a living house. God comes in to rebuild that house. At first, perhaps you, you understand what he's doing. He's getting the drains right and stopping the leaks in the roof and so on. You knew that those jobs needed doing and so you're, you're not surprised. Presently, he starts knocking the house about in a way that hurts abominably and does not seem to make sense. What on earth is he up to? The explanation is that he is building quite a different house than the one you thought of. Throwing out a wing here, putting on an extra floor there, running up towers, making courtyards. You thought you were going to be made into a decent little cottage but he is building a palace. He intends to come and live in it himself. Well, that describes what it is like when you yield your sovereignty to God. When you realize that I don't need to be the ruler of my own life, I need to completely surrender to him, I need him to rule over me, I need him to have his way, his will with me, and when you give yourself to him, it changes everything. Now, now, verse 1 of Romans 12 told us that our response to accepting the salvation that Jesus offers us is to present our bodies to him as a sacrifice. It had three adjectives. Living, that is that we're not a dying sacrifice. Jesus died that we might live. So, we're a living sacrifice. We're given completely to him to be consumed, but in life. We're to be holy, is like him. And thirdly, he uses that word acceptable or well-pleasing to God. Now mark that word. We're going to see it again. But I want you to understand that until you've taken the action of verse 1, you will find the steps of verse 2 impossible especially knowing the will of God. You cannot begin to really know the will of God for your life until and unless you've presented yourself to him as a living sacrifice, until you present your body to him with a resolve to remain a living, holy, well-pleasing sacrifice to him. 
well then keeping yourself from conformity to the world will not only prove impossible, but undesirable. You won't even want to be different from the world unless and until you present your body as a living sacrifice to him. This is, this is the point at which so many Christian lives fail. They falsely believe that there's some category of spiritual commitment but retaining bodily autonomy. In other words, oh, I, I want to be devoted to the Lord in my heart and my mind, but I want the right to do as I please with my body. Well, body and mind go together under the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Do you see, he says, present your body a living sacrifice, but the mind as well has to be renewed. So. Our presentation of our bodies to God, verse 1, also means a complete reorientation of our lives. That's what verse 2 is about. Now, according to verse 2, this complete reorient, reorientation of our lives, this, it, it, this complete redirection of where we're going and uh, a, a, a really a, a new description of who we are, this is marked by four things. The first one is nonconformity to the world. He says, and be not conformed to the world. Now, that in itself is a little bit different. You know, uh, pardon me for giving you a Greek class, but you look like you need one. So, you know, in English, we have two voices. The active voice, the boy kicked the dog. Uh, that's the active voice. The subject does the action. Then we have the passive voice. The boy was bitten by the dog he kicked. Serves him right. Was bitten. Oh, see, the, in that case, the subject is acted upon. The boy was bitten. Ah, passive voice. Now, in Greek, you've got the active voice, and you have the passive voice, but you also have a voice called the middle voice. In the middle voice, the subject acts on himself or itself. Now, here's the, here's the kicker. The middle voice and the passive voice most often have the same form. So you're not always sure, is this, is this the, the passive voice? In other words, should we, can, should we translate this, don't be conformed to the world? That would be the passive voice. Or should we translate this as a middle voice? Don't conform yourself to this world. In Greek, they're both the exact same form. So there's a case to make either way. I like J.B. Phillips' paraphrase of this verse. He says, don't let the world squeeze you into its mold. I like that paraphrase because I think it captures quite nicely both the middle and the passive sense of this. It's, it's, it's not all of one or the other. It's not as though the world is, is squeezing you without your consent. The world can't shape you and mold you without you giving in and going along. And that's why he says, don't conform yourself. Don't be conformed. I don't know if for sure if it's passive or middle. I know this, whether middle or passive, it's definitely essential. That if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you can't be conformed to this world. There are a lot of things that really the enemy uses to try and get us conformed to this world. You'll be conformed by seasons in life. You'll be conformed by struggles, by sin, by selfishness, by self-importance, by your fears, by sexual temptation, by relationships that you value above your sacrificial obedience to Christ. But you will either be conformed to this world or you'll be conformed to the next. You're going to fit in one world or the other, this world or the age to come. And you know what? determines which one you're conformed to are your loves. The things you love, your affections, your loves determine and reflect which world matters to you most. 
And in whatever way you are conformed to this world, to that degree you are not conformed to Christ and vice versa. So the first, the first mark of this Christian life is nonconformity to the world. And then he follows it up very closely with the second thing, which is transformation to the will of God. Don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed. It is, the Greek word here is the word where we get our, our word metamorphosis. To be metamorphosized. You, you're, you've, you're actually changing your spiritual shape. You know, we talk a lot about the will of God, and Christians talk a lot about knowing the will of God, knowing, oh, I want to know the will of God. Do you know the will of God for your life? Do you know how to know the will of God for your life? But if you read that the New Testament, when you find that phrase, the will of God, you will discover that more often than not, most of the time, it's not about knowing the will of God, it's about doing the will of God. Most of us know a lot more of the will of God than we actually do. And sometimes we concern ourselves more with that aspect of the will of God is, you know, well, do I take this job? Do I move in this house? Do I, what? We're talking about these things when we're simply not following the will of God in the things that we know. The biblical emphasis is always on doing the will of God, rarely merely knowing, and even then, you need to know it for practical reasons, not theoretical. And this transforms your direction. To be transformed to the will of God means it's a complete change of direction. In fact, this is reflected in the, in the word repent. How do you become a Christian? You have to repent and believe. And the word repent literally means a change of mind. It's a change of direction. I was going away from God, and when I repent, I turn toward God. I was going toward my idols, but I turn from idols to serve the living and true God. It's, it's a complete change of direction and also a change of your affections. You know, it, it, this is, Paul describes this different ways and different e epistles. In the book of Galatians, he, calls, he talks about learning to walk in the spirit, not according to the flesh. We heard Pastor Chris read about setting our affection on things above, not on things on the earth. Uh, and, you know, when Paul describes that, like in Galatians 5, beginning in verse 16, he says, I say, walk by the spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires, the affections of the flesh are against the spirit and the desires of the spirit against the flesh. For these are opposed to one another. For you, these are opposed to one another to keep you from doing the things you want to do. But if you are led by the spirit, you're not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control against such things. There is no law. You see, uh, when you are walking in Christ, there's a transformation. You know, it's a whole lot like learning a completely new language. If I were to give you a book in modern Hebrew, I'd say, here, read this. I mean, you First thing, you'd probably open the wrong end of the book. A, a book of Hebrew begins for us the back of the book. And in, you read it from back to front. You read it from right to left. There are no vowels. You have to know the language before you can actually read the language because you have to supply vowels that are not actually written in it. And it, is, it would be a completely different orientation for you to learn the language of Hebrew because you're 
you're accustomed to everything exactly the other way. You read from the front of the book to the back. You read from the left to the right. You need vowels. You, not, you like nice punctuation marks. And when you learn a new language, man, it's a struggle. You say, oh, this, this doesn't feel natural. Well, there's a reason. It's not natural. And this is precisely why we need the supernatural power of God. That when we present ourselves to him as a sacrifice, when we refuse to let the world conform us, shape us into its mold, that's when the Holy Spirit begins this work of transformation. You know, uh, Martin Luther's preface to his, his commentary on Romans puts it like this. He sums up the whole book of Romans in this way. He says, the sum and substance of this letter is to pull down, to pluck up, and to destroy all wisdom and righteousness of the flesh. As Christ says through the prophet Jeremiah, to pluck up and to break down and to destroy and to overflow. Namely, everything that is in us that is all that pleases us because it comes from ourselves and it belongs to us. And to build up and plant, namely everything that is outside of us and in Christ. That's how the gospel works. It's always a work of demolition and reconstruction. God is always tearing down that which is us by nature. We are in ourselves broken and sinful and our affections are wrong and that's what paul means by the third aspect of this reorientation which is the renewal of your mind don't be conformed to this world but be transformed how by the renewal of your mind well, what does that mean he he's talking about what our mind is set on remember earlier in the book of Romans, he talked to us about minding the things of the Spirit, not minding the things of the flesh. We, we heard there from Colossians 3, he says much the same thing there. Now look, boil it all down. What motivates you? What drives you? What makes you do the things you do? Every mind is motivated by four affections. Those affections are delight, desire, sorrow, and fear. And boil it all down, that's the way you live. There are things that delight you and you pursue them. There are desires you have that you want to satisfy. Sorrows motivate us. We want to avoid sorrow. A lot of times the avoidance of sorrow and suffering makes us make certain decisions. And fear. We're often motivated by being afraid of what the world thinks, what will happen to us, death, whatever it might be. Tim Keller put it like this. The greatest nightmare of the approval addict is rejection. Of the power addict, humiliation. Of the comfort addict, suffering. And of the control addict, uncertainty. Okay, you see how our affections, our avoidance, we, 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 we don't want certain things. We desire other things. This matrix of those four things, delight, desire, sorrow, fear, they shape the way we behave, the way we think, how we live. And in our hearts, we're always delighting in something. We're desiring something or someone. We're sorrowing over something lost to us or withheld from us. We're fearing something or someone. In, in other words, put them all together, <coughs> you pretty much just described worship. We're always worshiping something or someone with our affections. Now, coming to Christ means a complete change in all your affections, what you attach them to. Renewing your mind 
is resetting your affections. You're no longer going to desire the same things, delight in the same things. The same things don't make you sorrowful. Uh, and uh, you don't fear the same things. See, when the love of Christ comes in, love renews the mind. It resets priorities. It, it reconfigures paths. It extinguishes some passions while igniting others, ultimately transforming obedience and service from drudgery to delight. When your mind is renewed to things that you used to not want to do and not like, suddenly, man, they're, they're, there's a sweetness in them. You, you want things that you didn't want before, and the things that used to delight you no longer hold that delight for you. Now, I, I just I can't read about loves and delights and all that in my relationship with God without my, my mind and thoughts turning precisely to the most significant human relationship I have because these same things play out in marriage. The longer I live with Tanya, the less I love myself and the more I love her. You know how I can tell that? Because I don't mind her interruptions anymore. I don't feel put out by her request. And that, that has been a battle through the years. You know, when I'm sitting at my desk doing my studies, you know, I'm doing spiritual things, and she reminds me it's trash night. Uh, you know, there's no part of me that just loves taking out the trash. And in fact, Tony will tell you, I have an inordinate amount of hatred <laughs> for taking out the trash. I don't know. It's not, it's, no, it's not simple anymore. You know, when I was a kid, you took everything out, one sack, one pile, you dealt with one thing. Now it's like, okay, do we keep this? Do we, we recycle this? You know, and then Frankfurt and Lexington, they change what you could recycle on you. And it just gets so complicated. But you know what? I'm up at my desk. Tanya says, it's trash night. I don't like taking out the trash, but I love her. And no, let me take this off of you. Uh, you might, may or may not be surprised to know she takes care of mowing our yard. She, she, first of all, doesn't think I do a good job. Uh, and secondly, she likes that. Yesterday she was busy though, and you knew rain was coming soon at some point. And, and I heard her saying something about not having, you know, needing to get the yard. But I said, hey, let, let me do that for you. And I went outside and mowed the yard. I don't, you know, it's not that I just went, wow, I feel like mowing the yard. It's that I love her. I don't feel put out by her request. I find a joy in doing things that I would otherwise find odious, not because I like the thing, but because I love the one for whom I do it. And you know, I, I, it's still a battle. It's still, it's not perfect. And when I find that I fail to do that, then I repent and I return. I, I want to be more loving, not less. I want to be kinder, more compassionate, more devoted, more helpful. And as I have grown in affection, I've grown in action. This is how renewing your mind changes your affections. You delight in the things of God, the people of God, the will of God, the, the, the songs of God. I mean, things that were not your delight before, but when you know Jesus, Oh, how you delight in a totally different set of things. You desire God's will, not your own. I mean, why would anybody set aside natural physical desires unless they're out of the will of God? Uh, those desires might be anything. They could be sex, it could be food. Uh, there are any number of things that our bodies desire, but we can be fulfilling those desires completely outside of God's will. For instance, if you're married and a believer, you want a marriage for his glory. 
It's not just about your happiness. It's not about your satisfaction. Even in the most private and intimate parts of your marriage, things are changed because your desire changes. It's why Christians cannot let pornography shape your view of sex or, or, or let the world shape your view of what is acceptable. Because even in the most private, intimate aspects of your life, you want the Lord to have sovereignty over, over every aspect of it. You want it to be consistent with the values that he gives because he's changed the things you desire. And he's changed your sorrows too. You no longer sorrow over the things you sorrowed about, perhaps. You sorrow over the very sin you once enjoyed. You find yourself sorrowing over lostness in the world. The thought that there are people who do not hear the gospel that you and I hear on an almost daily basis. You, you sorrow over the hurts of the world that at one time did not seem to bother you. And now, as the Lord Jesus is transforming you, you fear God, not man, not death, not ostracism, not being marginalized by the world. You fear him. And, and when your mind is renewed, you, know, you, you, you no longer walk in the futility of your mind. That's, go, go back when you have time. Read Ephesians chapter 4, verses 17 through 32. Just read Paul's description of what, the, what it is to walk in the futility of your mind like what he calls the Gentiles do. But then to remind you what it is to walk now as a new person in Christ. Reread the passage that Pastor Chris read, Colossians 3, verses 1 through 17. Seek those things which are above. Set your affection on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. It's a complete reorientation of your affections and your desires, a refocusing of what you pursue, what you desire. And when your mind is renewed, then you are proving the will of God. Don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. With the result that, with a view toward proving what is that good and perfect, acceptable will of God. And you see, I like this word proving, testing. How do you prove the will of God? Well, he says, by testing, you discern the will of God. Now, you're going to be tested for sure. All the enemy's tricks have the singular purpose to get you away from the cross. Satan wants you to look at life through the lens of self, self-centeredness, self fulfillment and that's completely antithetical to the cross of Jesus Christ but when you cling to the cross when you realize that I am crucified with Christ nevertheless I live yet not I but Christ lives in me the life that I now live I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me I'm living life for him now you can test God's will through the lens of redemption. Because you're, you're, it's no longer, okay, what can I, I'm a Christian, how much can I do and still be, be called a Christian? How much can I get away with? No, man, that, that's, that's absolutely the opposite of the Christian mindset. It's how closely to Christ can I walk? How much can can I show him joy? You see, uh, it, let's be honest. It's not a straight line. I, I wish sanctification were just, you know, we're just always moving forward. We're all, it's always progressive. When I'm holier today than I was yesterday. But, you know, 
Ed Welch said, sanctification is like taking a slow, clumsy walk rather than flicking a light switch from off to on. But by God's grace, we grow. That's it, isn't it? It's, uh, oh, it's not just, oh, a switch got thrown and suddenly we had it all figured out. No, this is why we constantly are being transformed. There's a constant renewal of our minds and through this renewal, we're discerning the will of God. Tanya and I this week watched a documentary on some streaming service called Still, a Michael J. Fox movie. It, it was absolutely hopeful, gut-wrenching. Uh, I, I, it's hard to describe it. It's just showing what his life is like now because of his Parkinson's disease. And his walking, to just to see the effort it takes him to walk across the room or down the street. It, his walking is fraught with falling. Stumbling is a staple of life. His family's always talking to him about falling, and he just says, look, falling is part of it. It's just what I do. He falls, and he breaks his hand, and they put pins in it. He falls and breaks his cheekbone, and they put pins in it. He falls as he's walking down the street with his trainer beside him trying to help him stay upright, and a woman passes him and says, hey, Mr. Fox, and just as he turns to try and acknowledge her, he falls. This is his life. Sanctification can be like that initially. You're learning a new way to walk. It's completely different from the old way you walked. But because of redemption, you will discern that the will of God what God wants for your life, what he's transforming you to become and to do, the will of God is, first of all, good. It's the first adjective Paul uses to describe the will of God. It's good. God's will for you is absolutely the best thing that could ever happen in your life. We tend to think of God's will as just misery. Oh, you know, here's what I want, but I'm going to do the will of God. Listen. You will never find a sweeter, happier, more contented place to be than right in the will of God when you just yield yourself to him. Uh, it, you know, if, if I could go back and change anything about my life, the truth is I just would mess it up. Every door that has been closed, God closed it for my good. Every door that has been opened, he opened it for my good and his glory. And when you discern that the will of God is good, what you're saying is, you believe Romans 8, 28. Secondly, he says it's well-pleasing. It's acceptable. Now, mark that word. It's the same word that he used, one of the three words he used in verse 1 to describe our sacrifice. We give ourselves as a sacrifice that is holy, well-pleasing to God living, holy, well-pleasing. Now, this is the same word. Just as our sacrifice is well-pleasing to God, so God's will is always acceptable to us when we're transformed, when we're renewed, because God's working all things together for our good. This word, the third word he uses is complete or perfect. Some translations say perfect, but it simply means matured. That when you are transformed by this renewal of your mind, then you're discerning that the will of God is good and acceptable and complete. It's matured. It's adult. It's, it's, it's initiated. A life truly surrendered to Christ experiences the reality of Romans 8, 28. You trust that he's working his will always for your good. Even in the hurts and the pains, what's he doing? He's transforming your affections. Why? Because you love him and your affection has changed your trust. Don't lose sight of every week when that first slide goes up that it tells you the name of this series I'm preaching in Romans, The Great Exchange. This is what it looks like when you exchange 
your sovereignty over your body, over your mind, over your life for his. You're exchanging conformity to the world for conformity to Christ. You're exchanging the form of godliness for the power of godliness. Your desire for better things will only come by the renewal of your mind. As you yield yourself, you say, Lord, I'm asking you to change my affections, change my desires, cause me to delight in the right things, to desire the right things, to sorrow over the things that break your heart, to fear only you. Change my affections. And when you present your body to the Lord as a living sacrifice, and your mind is renewed after the Spirit, the thing that you want more than anything in all the world is the will of God. Because it's good and acceptable and perfect. Now, how could I end this sermon without an illustration from Homer? You look like you need one. In the Odyssey, Odysseus and his men encounter many challenges. And when, they, when Odysseus is on the island of Circe, the witch, she warns him about a, 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 a challenge that he and his men are going to face. When they leave her, they're going to face the Isle of the, of the Sirens. On the Island of the Sirens, they lure sailors to the rocky coast of their island where their, ship is cra where their ship crashes and then they devour their bodies. And how do they do this? Because they have this enticing, alluring song that men find irresistible. So Circe warns Odysseus what he must do. She says, you need to get beeswax and put it in the ears of your men so they cannot hear the song. But if you want to hear it, have them lash you to the mast so that as they row by the island, untouched by the siren song, you will hear a most beautiful melody but be unable to respond. And when they see you struggling to be free, tell them in advance, warn them to tie you, bind you even more tightly to the mast. So Odysseus and his men do exactly that. He puts beeswax in their ears. They sail past the Isle of the Sirens. Odysseus lashed to the mast. His men are impervious to this beautiful song. They row by. Odysseus, hearing it, he's enticed. He desires to go to the source. He, he struggles to be set free. He, he uses his face and his brow to motion to his men to let him loose so that he can go to it. And two of his strongest, most trusted sailors, they, they simply get up and they bind him more tightly until the danger has passed. There's another ancient Greek story. Jason and the Argonauts. Jason, too, has to sail his ship, the Argo, past the Isle of the Sirens. But Jason has brought with him a Thracian bard by the name of Orpheus, who can play his lute so beautifully that it said he could even charm the rocks. And when Jason and his men sail past the Isle of the Sirens, he has all of his men assemble right there, the center of the ship, in front of the mast, while, while Orpheus plays the most beautiful music because when he plays, his music is so beautiful that whoever hears it can hear nothing else. The siren songs were ignored because Jason and his men were captivated by the even more beautiful music of Orpheus and they sailed by safely. You see, people who have surrendered to Christ and renewed their minds are not prisoners to passion, chained to the mast of the, of the cross against their will, 
chained and bound by dogma and doctrine and duty, but still longing for the deadly embrace of sin. Holiness really would be dreary if all it, all it were is the avoidance of sin, it is the struggle against sin. But when we have heard the sweeter song of redemption, the call of sin just fades away. To us who have yielded our sovereignty to the Lord Jesus, to, to those of us who have given our bodies as a sacrifice and we're asking his Holy Spirit to help us not be conformed to this world, but to be transformed by the renewing of our minds. To us, the song of holiness, is a, it's a song of gladness. It's not a it's not dreary. Uh, under the cross, we're liberated to hear a heavenly song. Holiness is not a burden, but a joy. It's not a duty, but a delight. How does the, the message of the Bible itself end? Revelation twenty two seventeen 17 plays us the sweetest song when it says the Holy Spirit says, the spirit and the bride say, come, and let the one who hears say, come, and the one who is thirsty, come. Let the one who desires the water of life buy without price. Oh, do you desire it? Notice the progression. You present your body, you reject the world, your affections are transformed, and then you discern the will of God, and it's good, and it's acceptable, and it's perfect. Or you keep your sovereignty over yourself, you conform to the world, you focus your affections on yourself, and you don't have a clue about the will of God. Your life will either be shaped by the gospel or lost in your own will. You better plead with God to help you not be conformed to this world, but to be transformed by the renewal of your mind so that you can discern, you can test what is the good an acceptable, perfect will of God.